So here's the thing about phylogenies. They can tell us an evolutionary history, but again, rate points and starting points are really tough. So for instance, if I was to look at these points as art frogs, intuitively, what would you say? Same species, different species? Different species, they're totally different. Same species, just have different pigmentation in the skin, just like we do. Look at these things, look almost identical. Just by intuition, would you say same species? I'd say same species. Completely different species don't breed with each other. These completely interbreeding, these will fuse to breed with each other, sing a different song, right? Western full frog, excuse me, leopard frog. Um, I just screwed two up, not eastern or western, but northern and <laughs> southern leopard frog, okay? So here's some different ways to think about speciation. This is an old concept, but it's still utilized today, and it's called the biological species concept, first developed by Ernst Mayer in 42. And so in this particular case, what is the distinction of a species? It is this, species are groups of interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. It's exactly what we've been talking about, right? So the capacity to contribute to a shared pool of genes is qualification for membership in that species. That's basically what it comes down to. If I could share genes with you, we're the same species. It has limitations. It only works for what? You have to be a sexually reproducing organism, which basically eradicates, you know, 80-90% of the planet. So it doesn't work for microbes that are asexual, it doesn't work for asexual fungus. There are many plants that have asexual stages, it doesn't work for them. But it does work quite cleanly for sexually reproducing organisms such as ourselves. So there are definite limitations to it. Now, here's another example. Take a look at this. Would you think that that would be the same or different species? Quite different. Actually, they're the same species. One is a worker, the other is a soldier. Just morphological differences within the species itself. Over here, we've talked about that before. Look identical, do exactly the same things. Superficially, you'd say, same species. Completely different because, again, they sing what? A different song. So morphology lets us down a lot. And it's usually, if that's one of the most common ways to think about differences in species. So first of all, can they reproduce with each other? But that only works for a small subset. Then we can look at the basic morphology. But I've already showed you plenty of examples where that fails. So in the morphological species concept, we're based on what it looks like, right? What are the structural characteristics of a particular species or organism? And it can be applied, the nice part about it is you can apply it to sexual reproducing organisms, you can apply it to asexual reproducing organisms too. There's the advantage of it, but it has tons of limitations. First of all, there's a radical degree typically of variation within a species in terms of morphology. There's lots of differences. Ontogenetic niche shift, what does that mean, do you know? Do you look exactly the same you did the day you were born? Completely different. So in ontogenetic niche shifts, you look different as you develop from being a juvenile to an adult, from you're basically a baby to a juvenile to an adult, right? Completely different in your morphology. Not only that, but you act in different ways, you occupy different places, you eat different kinds of food, and so you're changing the whole way across it. So characteristics are quite different from the old to the very young. So that's a problem. Things like the butterflies and moths are really tough because you're looking at something as a larval form that's a caterpillar, but then all of a sudden as an adult, it's this winged, beautiful animal, right? So completely different things. So how do you know where the species is actually at if you're just looking at the morphology? Have you ever seen this butterfly down at the bottom left? You recognize that? Anybody recognize that animal? That's called the blue morpho. It's, it's an endangered butterfly in many areas because it's prized for collectors. And so they used to go out and collect it and then they sell it to all the butterfly collectors out there. And for a while it seemed like that was an okay thing. It didn't seem to be a big impact, but they have problems catching the butterfly because it's kind of elusive. Well, they found an easy way to collect them. You know how they collect blue morpho butterflies today? You go into a local village where they're found in this surrounding habitat and you basically go up to the kids and you say, I'll give you a nickel for every butterfly you catch and they bring them in by the hundreds and hundreds, right? Stripping the entire forest of the blue world. Paleontolog paleontological species concept. Well, there's lots of things that we only have a fossil record of. They're not living anymore. That's a pretty inaccurate record because it's missing lots of pieces. 
Now we don't know exactly what the organism looked like externally. We have lots of techniques for building it up, and forensic science is really great for this. You'd be amazed sometimes when you see forensic science, they get a skeleton, they rebuild it to what the person looked like, and then you actually get to see what the person is, and they're almost identical. Have you ever seen that? I love the forensic science work that's done on early human evolution, like taking the skeletons of early humans and putting all the, because you can tell from the fossil on the bones and all the little extensions, protuberances where muscles attach, and you can get really clean representations. So I love to see those things, because I bet you they're really accurate. You're really looking at something quite similar to the living animal that existed back several hundred thousand to millions of years ago, right? Okay. So it's limitations again, limited evidence. We don't have fossils of everything. And here's the thing as well. Most organisms don't fossilize well. You fossilize well because you have a bony endoskeleton, but invertebrates don't. Invertebrates number is 100 to 1. So those things don't fossilize well at all. And the other thing is, it's tough to make a fossil. It's not like you just drop dead and you're instantly a fossil. It doesn't work that way. You have to die in a really unique habitat that covers you up quickly with sediment, gets rid of all the oxygen, the mineral composition the soil has to be right, it has to pull all that stuff out. Because what you're looking at is not a bone anymore, it's a mineral cast of bone. And so those conditions are quite rare. You see them at like swampy regions, the tar pits are a nice place to like that. Um, river systems where you get covered with sediments, that's another way to have it. So it has lots of limitations. Ecological species concept is one that bases the species on their ecological niche. This one is widely inaccurate. So its limitations are it's really hard to decide what a niche is. The niche is multi-dimensional axes. Remember the n-dimensional hypervolume business? And the problem with that is, is your niche changes. So it can expand, it can contract. So this is a very tricky one. It's hard to define exactly what a niche is. And again, that niche is quite flexible over the lifetime of an organism. This by far is one of the most powerful techniques, which is number five, which is the phylogenetic species concept. And so the phylogenetic species concept basically is establishing the separation of organisms based on their unique genetic histories at a molecular level. So it compares the physical characteristics of molecular sequences within those organisms. And there's a bunch of different techniques for doing that. Some of them are really neat. I probably did one in the lab. Have you guys done a, um, let's see, a, a DNA hybridization yet? Did you guys do that one? Where you take your DNA and you split it and then you replicate it? You've done that and you did a DNA amplification problem, right? So it's using the same technique as a DNA amplification. But the difference is, you just amplified your own DNA, right? And then you saw if you had a little marker on it, something probably? Okay, so in this case, you do exactly the same technique. So DNA amplification is an amazing tool. You take a small subset of your DNA, you're going to replicate that over and over and over again through a process of what? Eating it, which does, splits the two strands, and then what do you do? You anneal the do, basis onto it, and then what? You pull it, and it goes back together. And you do that over and over and over again so that you can have that marker. Forensic science does this all the time in terms of DNA testing to see who culprits were in terms of certain crimes. You can learn all kinds of things genetically about yourself, whether you're carrying certain markers for certain diseases that are genetically um, housed, on and on and on. So here's the difference. You can utilize this as a technique for determining species composition by hybridizing the DNA. So here's how it works. Let's say you're interested in knowing what the difference was between yourself and chimpanzee. So I would do the same process. I would take your DNA sample, I take the chimpanzee DNA sample, I heat them up. What's going to happen to them? They're going to they're going to unwind and split, and then I'm going to basically anneal, and so all the bases come in. Now here's the interesting thing about that. So when I split them open, it's just a code. What's the code? It's the simplest code in the world. This is what's so cool about DNA, right? Every living organism on the planet shares the same molecular unit of inheritable information. And it's a simple code with four letters. What are they? A, G, C, T. C goes with? G. A goes with? G. And vice versa. That's it. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. The difference between you and the lowliest bacteria is just changes in that code. So here's the thing, when you open them up, and now you let them go back together, well, an A 
to a T on the human being is the same thing as an A and a T to human human, an A and a T to a chimp chimp. Does that make sense? So basically you can get the human piece pairing right up with the chimpanzee piece. But there's one issue. So what I do is I first I do it for a human being. I open it and I see how many calories of heat are required to split. And it's going to be quite heavy because there are all those bonds are perfect. A to T, C to G, all the way down the line. It's like a zipper that you have to peel open. And it requires a lot of energy to do so. So I measure it. And then I measure that for the chimp, but I do the same thing to them. And they're all evenly paired up. So I have a calorie count of energy required to do the split. Now I let them anneal and come together as hybrids. Some are still human to human, some are still chimp to chimp. There's gonna be hybridized DNA in there. Now here's the trick. When I open the human human one back up, how many calories of heat should be required? Exactly what I started with. Chimp to chimp should be exactly what I started with. But what about the hybrid? It's gonna be less than the original. Why? because they don't match up perfect, that's it. Maybe I get the A, T, T, A, but now my C is with an A, no match. Maybe I get a C and a G and a G and a C, but now I got a T and a G, no match. So that means since it's the, the zipper isn't fully locked and there's pieces missing, it's easier to pull apart. So based on how many calories of energy are required to open it, I can tell how similar an organism is in terms of evolutionary history. So if I do that with a chimpanzee, do you know what the relatedness is? It is really close, way more close than you would think. Any idea? 98% plus similarity. The difference between human hemoglobin and chimp hemoglobin is one base pair. Pretty crazy, right? So that's the, it's how it, it, it intensely accurate this thing is. Now here's the trick. If I did that with human being and a snail, is that gonna require more or less heat than the chimp human hybrid? way less, because we split way further back in evolutionary history, and we share far fewer pairings. So that's a much easier zipper to bust. You and bacteria, almost nothing, right? So that's the trick. I can basically say who's closer related to each other in evolutionary time versus the amount of energy required to split the hybrid DNA. It's a great technique. It has a limitation, though. What's the limitation? What is it? What percent? What percent? Yes, what percent what? What percent difference is it before it's a new species? It doesn't answer that. We don't know that. So it'll tell me all the percentage difference, but what determines it? I just showed you that a chimp is 98% similarity. But it's different, right? So that's something that it doesn't answer. Another thing is the molecular clock, which is a cool way to actually measure difference too. So we talked a while ago about maladaptive, adaptive, and neutral traits, yes? An adaptive trait gives you what? An advantage in survivability and reproduction. A maladaptive trait will do what? It will decrease your survivability and reproductive success, and a neutral trait does nothing. So therefore, the frequency of maladaptive traits go what? From generation to generation. They go down. The frequency of adaptive traits do what? They go up, but neutral traits, they accumulate, okay? They don't, you don't lose them, you don't add to the population. So they're just like something you hang on to. And we already said that's a good thing, why? Because if the environment changes, they can become adaptive, maladaptive, but it's there another thing that you may have. So here's the thing, because they accumulate over time, you can use them as a clock. And you can basically say, how many neutral mutations have I accumulated versus you as a different organism over time? The more neutral mutations in the count is more similar, the more closely related we are. The, different, the more different the count is, the further back we were separated. But again, what's the dilemma? What's the percent? So it's a fabulous technique, but we have yet to establish the criteria for what determines the distinction between one species or another. So often what we do, in this case, since none of them are perfect,